spiraling Re deficit. Is right. there any Re correlation reclaiming, there? Reclaiming my time, I would say respectfully to the gentleman, you know, it is not good enough to know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. There is a difference in spending. There is a difference between purchasing a consumable and making a strategic investment, and quite frankly, your State has really benefited from the latter, as has mine. The premise of this hearing is nothing but, in my view, a raw partisan assertion that presupposes the answer. We don't say in the title of this hearing, are Obama's green energy uh, uh, is Obama's green energy agenda creating jobs? That would be a fair intellectual uh, pursuit. We say how Obama's green energy agenda is killing jobs, which gives away transparently the agenda and the intent of the majority in putting together this hearing. It is not an honest intellectual pursuit, and that is too bad. Because what a lost opportunity, because I really would have liked a hearing that actually did go in depth into, well, you know, how are you keeping numbers? You know, are we disappointed in some investments uh, that didn't work out? Are there some that are panning out that we, you know, we're happy with or we didn't, we didn't expect would have the kind of payoff they did? But that's not really what we're about here. And, and just sadly, in looking at how sometimes we perform, you've been cut off in trying to give some answers or explain. You've been told it's a yes or no so that, of course, we box you in. So that, so that nothing gets on the record from you three that is unwanted or that contradicts the false premise of this hearing. And for that, I'm very sad. It's a missed opportunity. And I hope someday that uh, you know, we can put aside partisan gotcha and yet another hearing and trying our best to embarrass an administration and actually have an honest intellectual pursuit. And so with that, I yield back my time. I yield back my time. Oh, the yes, gentleman I yield, the I gentleman yield back. Would you like to reclaim your time? I would reclaim my the time. The gentleman reclaims his time. As a matter of courtesy to the ranking member. Thank yes. you very much. I just want to go to a, uh, just this uh, New York Times piece, which is very interesting. It uh, the, um, talks about, it says here, the bankruptcies of three American solar power companies in the last month, including Solyndra of California, and this is dated 9 19, 2011, including Solyndra of California on Wednesday, have left China's industry with a dominant sales position, almost three fifths of the world's production capacity, and rapidly declining costs. Uh, some American, Japanese, and European solar companies still have a technological edge over Chinese rivals but seldom a cost advantage, according to the industry. Loans at very low rates from state-owned banks in Beijing, cheap or free land from local and provincial governments across China, huge economies of scale and other cost advantages has transformed China from a minor player in the solar power in industry just a few years ago into the main producer of an increasingly competitive source of electricity. Uh, you have a comment on, on that? To Yes, sir, uh, Congressman. We can get it back. Mm -hmm. We have got the best innovation, the Abound case that was just noted. We have got some great technologies, and there is no one who is better in innovation, marketing, and making the private sector work for the American And it can people. create jobs. Absolutely. Hundreds of thousands of jobs already we have created. Thank you, Mr. I thank the gentleman. We now go to um, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Amash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, gladly yield my time back to you. I thank the gentleman. I thank him a lot. Uh, Mr. Uh, Poneman, I am going to zero in on something that uh, Secretary Solis said about what well, we, you know, we, don't, we don't create these jobs by hiring the people. We, we, in fact, train them and the private sector hires them. Then how do you explain that the jobs created at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, a DOE-funded lab, basically government jobs, they were allowed to and successfully bid for the Algerian contract for uh, carbon sequestration monitoring against an American company, Halliburton, and their Canadian partner. 
They underbid an American company that would have put the jobs in Houston, and instead they used government, a government lab to underbid them. Why is it DOE is bidding against the private sector at all? Why is it that you, in fact, undercut an American company's attempt to bid in a foreign country? Why? Two points, Congressman. Uh, number one, to be clear, uh, like all of our national laboratories, Lawrence Berkeley is a government-owned contractor operated facility, uh, point one. Point two, I am not familiar with the specific uh, facts of the uh, matter that you have We will give it to you and I'm you can respond for the record. Respond. Uh, but contractor funded, I am very familiar. I have visited many of the labs and certainly a lot of uh, both our overt and covert facilities. Bottom line is taxpayer dollars prop that up, special considerations, even special patenting capability and the like, all of which are available to Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley and the others, uh, Los Alamos. Why are, presuming that this is a correct report, why is it that they should be bidding at all for contracts that are private sector contracts? There are many of these uh, bids, Congressman, I am not familiar with this particular case, in which there are consortia, in which there are a number of private and academic and other institutions. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing I just want to note, we have worked very, very hard so that the intellectual property that has been developed in those national laboratories actually gets spun out to the private sector so that it promotes and stimulates private investment. So I am very happy to look at the particulars of this case and get back to you, but I am not familiar with it from what you have described. Well, you know, uh, you brought it up, so I will just be quite candid. You don't own the intellectual property when these labs do it. Individuals, inventors at the labs using government money ultimately spin them out and become very wealthy. It is one of the problems of the labs. And if you don't know it, you have only been on since March of 2009, take a look at it. In fact, that has been part of our problem is we fund people to, to in fact, develop. We give them special access. And then, yes, we do, we do commercialize. The problem is we take our money and allow somebody to commercialize it, basically making entrepreneurism on the back of the taxpayers. But I will give you the information on this so that you can answer for the record. Uh, Madam uh, Secretary, once again, I am going to just review the facts. Uh, and, Dr. Hall, I would like you to weigh in on this. When you train somebody to drive a bus, if it is a hybrid bus, it is a green job. That was from your own statement on Mr. Reyes, correct? Yes. Okay. Dr. Hall, can you today give this committee, and Mr. Connolly left, and I apologize that he is not here, but I am sure he will get word. The premise of ours is that you have got bad numbers because you haven't had the metrics in order to get good numbers. If I put LEDs in my office, apparently my staff becomes a green staff. If my, uh, if my staff director drives in in a hybrid, I guess he becomes a green person. If a lobbyist is paid a million dollars a year here to lobby for green grants, apparently it is a green job. What are the number of green jobs, real jobs that go on past government contracting or government subsidies today that are actually net increases since the President took office? Well, the, uh, the measurement the two surveys I talked about were actually in the process of collecting data for the first time. So okay, so in the future, numbers. you will be able to give us numbers. But today, yes. your numbers are clearly wrong unless you make the assumption that teaching a bus driver to drive a bus is a green job, understanding that there are no new net bus drivers created. There is only somebody driving a bus with a battery instead of a bus with just an engine and a starter battery, right? Our, our our green jobs include mass transit. So actually, any bus service, whether it's oh, okay. Gas or so not, let me included. understand this, because Mr. Connolly had some righteous indignation. You're counting everyone that drives a bus as a green job. Mass transit is a green service. Yes. Oh my goodness, I didn't know that, Mr. Poneman. One last question. Yes, sir. There was some hyperbole her er earlier about Beijing's terrible environment. Isn't it true that Americans enjoy the acid rain from China and, and uh, Vietnam's abysmal use of coal by not cleaning it up and simply pouring it into the air? Ultimately, that, that terrible Beijing ends up falling on the heads of Californians, and our cleaner, much cleaner facilities using coal and natural gas 
do not produce the kind of acid rain they produce? Alas, this is a global problem, and the emissions that happen in one country uh, certainly transmit to the other country. And that is why we have got to address this on a global basis, and we are trying to do that every day. I would submit that no one is addressing China. China is doing what they want to do and stealing our jobs, and we are actually enabling it. With that, I go to the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me welcome our witnesses. Uh, it is certainly a pleasure to see our former colleague, uh, Secretary of Labor. It is a pleasure indeed, Dr. Pondman, Dr. Hall. You know, I was amazed, quite frankly, as I tried to analyze the title of this hearing, and that is the idea that the green energy agenda is killing jobs. And it sort of it struck me, how can you kill something <laughs> that is already dead? <laughs> that the jobs are not being killed by the energy program that is being developed and articulated, that job opportunities are being increased and I want to especially thank and commend you, Madam Secretary, for the training programs that people in the congressional district that I represent, thousands and thousands and thousands of low-income people in an inner-city community who basically migrated from some of those areas that have been discussed and have had opportunities denied them because business and industry has flown. And so I commend you and the Department for the sensitivities that you have displayed, for the understanding. I also want to commend uh, my colleague from Virginia for his understanding of Tennessee history and, and the recognition of how impactful government intervention has been on raising the quality of life in areas throughout the country. Dr. Hall, let me ask you, uh, because I am interested in the numbers that the Chairman asked about, how soon do you think we will be able to get those? Uh, we will start producing the green goods and services uh, data in uh, the first quarter of two, uh, 2012. And by the middle of 2012, we will have the second survey results uh, with the green technology and practices. Thank you very much. Let me just ask, uh, you know, there are people who argue that investing in green companies, the government is picking winners and losers. But investing in the energy industry is not new to government. We have done it for a long time, especially <laughs> subsidies to oil companies, to big oil. Now, instead of focusing predominantly on the fossil fuel projects, the Department of Energy loan programs appear to be promoting investment in a more diverse array of energy sectors. Dr. Poindman, let me ask you, can you describe the various energy sectors that the Department of Energy has made loan guarantees to? And can you de describe what factors the Department takes into account in determining which companies get these loans? Thank you, Congressman. I will uh, answer both parts of that question. We have invested uh, loan guarantees in the first nuclear power plant to be built in this country in three decades. We have invested in the largest wind farm in the world, some of the largest solar facilities in the world. We have invested in geothermal. Uh, we have invested in uh, 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 wind farms. The criteria that we use, the criteria that were wisely put into uh, statute by the U.S. Congress going back to 2005 uh, and uh, later in 2009, we look for those projects that are innovative. Uh, that can make a significant difference uh, in terms of uh, creating a competitive, uh, successful industry that hires American workers. Our uh, data so far suggests we are generating hundreds of thousands of jobs. I had the opportunity, speaking of Tennessee, to go to Smyrna, Tennessee, to open a Nissan Leaf factory uh, that is already uh, hiring 
uh, seven to 800 workers, and when in permanent operation, we'll have 1,300 workers. We have got uh, Iraqi war veterans who are working on a desert uh, facility for solar in the Mojave Desert. Uh, we have uh, 1,000 uh, green employees in the A123 factory in Romulus, Michigan, uh, taking people like Annette Herrera and giving them jobs after they have been looking for two and a half years. We have seen this works. We can win this future. Mr. Chairman, could I ask your indulgence for a minute to ask a question? Of Without objection, you, the gentleman will be given an additional minute. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, let me ask, what, what are the factors that your agency considers when you are trying to determine who get training grants and, and what kind of training opportunities would be uh, created as a result of those expenditures? Uh, Congressman Davis, uh, this is a competitive grant process, so uh, what we look for are obviously the potential for partnership. Industry has to be a part of that. It could be labor management. It could be a community based with uh, an employer. Uh, and we have to look at the information that they provide in terms of market research, where the jobs will be, where, where there is a need and where there is an educational gap. It is a very competitive process. Actually, in one of our grants alone uh, that we gave out, Pathways Out of Poverty to direct funding to low-income communities with high, po uh, high rates of poverty, we were oversubscribed. We only could give out close to less than 90 grants. And there were over 400 applicants. So we know that there's a need, there's an interest. And these were a combination of industry working with communities and, and community colleges. So there is a great need. We are sorely underfunding, in my opinion, these kinds of efforts. We have to have a better trained workforce. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the very patient gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. And, and I would not disagree that President Obama's ideas on green jobs, he really believes that is a way we should go. But when you look at the history of our country, the ability to power up all over this country really is what created the, the jobs that we had back then. And, and we, we powered up the rural community. We did an awful lot of things because we had so many natural resources right here. And I hear people reference China and Germany. And I would su suggest that yeah, China is one of the biggest purchases of coal from us. Uh, they also do things a little bit differently than we do. Uh, so I'm not, I don't want to model ourselves after China or Germany. I, Germany has a problem with natural resources. But I think most people would agree. And in our business, one of the things we sit down each year and we try to project what we're going to do the next year, and I'm in the automobile business, one of our costs, of course, is the cost of money, but also the cost of energy. And by far, the, the most affordable thing for me is the fossil fuels. And most economists agree. So, okay, if, if energy is a, a component of what's going to drive your ultimate cost of operation, then shouldn't we be looking at making sure that energy, energy costs stay low? And, and Secretary, I would ask you, Secretary Parliament. I mean, is that something we all agree on? If we're really concerning about jobs and creating jobs, I, I would also suggest that maybe we also need to consider keeping the jobs we already have and making sure that they have a more sustainable life. So if you, is that something you would agree on? I mean, I think most economists agree that the low cost of energy really does help job creators. I, I agree, but I also know that um, because of what we saw happening in the automobile industry, in fact, in Detroit and in the, the northeast section, uh, we saw that the competition with foreign uh, builders from Japan, China, and Korea, South Korea were actually better at producing more fuel efficient cars. Yeah, that kind we, of you know, and and us we know to, why they were, because their cost of buying fuel was a lot greater than ours for a long, long time. They imported all. We had it right here. The cost of gasoline was very inexpensive in the States, and that's why we continued to build what we built, because it was affordable. And we could build those cars. I mean, if somebody had a choice, and I got to tell you, I'm a Chevrolet dealer. The fact that we use $7,500 of taxpayer money to sell a Chevy Volt, to me, does not seem to be a very good investment for tax, from, from a tax income. I, 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 don't real, I don't believe that. I believe that people will buy other cars, in a, in a, they are more affordable. And if we have to use taxpayer money to sell that car, that doesn't make sense to me. But my point is, if energy is a true cost of your total operation, for a job creator, that is that's important. People in, in, in my industry and in, in other small businesses, they really do. That is a component. So when we tell them that, listen, the traditional energies that made us great and were very affordable, now we are going to go to green energy, even though heavily subsidized with taxpayer money, is much more expensive. Now, how does that drive my cost of operation down? 
those uh, industries, GM, Chrysler, have actually paid back their loans. And I can tell you, well, but they paid back with the, they overborrowed the and paid lines. back with money that they I've, overborrowed. And I and, and please, I don't want to get into that. My question is is it directly related to jobs? So I don't know. In my area of the country, with Northwest Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania has been taught, called the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. We got a third of the world's coal beneath our surface. I have friends in, in western Pennsylvania that cannot get a permit to mine coal anymore because the EPA took over primacy from the Pennsylvania DEP. No, I, I can tell you what. So in the interest of creating green jobs and creating green energy, which is more expensive than fossil fuel, and, and we're saying, yeah, we want to create jobs, and what we're going to do is we're going to penalize the people that already create cheap energy. We're going to come out with a taxpayer-subsidized new green energy, and if the ultimate cost is still higher than what we had, how does that help us? Well, I'll tell you that the Brookings... Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I was, I was going to... It's a great point. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great question, Congressman. Let me be very clear. We all, number one, the premise about trying to get the low cost of energy, that's exactly right. That's why we're trying to drive down the cost of solar to five to six cents, levelized cost of electricity, and then it competes, point one. Point two, we have used this program to protect the existing jobs. We protected 33,000 jobs. Ford Motor Company through our loan guarantee program making incremental improvements. Yeah, but, but, but Ford, I'm not talking about Ford or GM now. I'm, I'm talking about at some point Those all these industries. Jobs. Well, no, 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 no. Those industries, okay, they, they compete in a global market. I understand that. We're talking about the cost of energy right. in all these different businesses, okay? Right. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about do these green initiatives really create jobs? And I, my other question was we already have a base of jobs now creating traditional energy, and we're holding them back. And that's, that's not arguable. We're actually holding these people back. Now, it, it is true. And at some point, at some point, I've raised four children, and they all learned to ride a bike. And they start off with training wheels. But sooner or later, you've got to take the training wheels off. That's right, sir. And I'm saying in these, in these green initiatives, we look at ethanol, we look at all these things. People are saying, look, this just doesn't work. It just doesn't make sense. My question is, when do you take the training wheels off and when do you stop subsidizing this when the ultimate product is greater cost than the one we already have? And we have it in great supplies. We're not running out. This is a great question because the question is, are we building the future or are we building the past? If we want to win competitively in this country, we're going to have to beat, just as we did in the Industrial Revolution and the Technology Revolution and the and I Revolution. That. I understand the that. Why are we penalizing? Why are we penalizing the people that already do To the contrary, right now? sir, we are, we are investing heavily. Uh, you, and I, in, you and I will disagree on that. I will tell you that the investments that we're making, at some point, we cannot continue to fund these. I'm not, listen, I think we need to take a look at these. But at the end of the day, we're making it very difficult for job creators. We're driving their costs up with no benefits. Look at the back my making, uh, uh, the I, I think the gentleman, coal. although his time has expired, if you'd like to briefly answer. Thank you. Just briefly, uh, Congressman, we are investing very uh, heavily. Our $3.4 billion we're putting into our uh, carbon capture and sequestration and our, our CCPI program. We are strongly supporting our existing technology and our existing industries, as well as investing in the future. We think we can win the future. I thank both the gentlemen. I would now ask unanimous consent that the earlier described emails be included in the record. Without objection, so order. Additionally, I would ask that the L.A. Times uh, environmental page, which I'm going to give you a copy of, that shows that the endangered tortoise is now making the aforementioned solar Mojave Desert uh, project on uh, a hiatus for the foreseeable future based on, make sure I describe it right, the 38 reptiles that might die. So uh, hopefully Mojave Desert jobs will someday happen, but right now 38 tortoises stand in the way. And with that, we recognize the gentleman from Manchester, New Hampshire, Mr. Ginta, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming today. I wanted to um, move into a little bit of a different direction if I could ask and direct my comments to Secretary Solis. Uh, I wanted to actually talk to you a little bit about a project in New Hampshire that I think you're familiar with, the Job Corps Center that's been long time in, in, um, in the making, and there have been a lot, of, um, a lot of delays related to a lot of different issues. But first, I wanted to um, convey to you that our delegation is intent on working collectively to try to make this project happen, make it happen timely um, uh, and as quickly as, can, as we can and, and certainly under budget. Uh, so to that, um, to that extent, could you give me a, just a quick status update on at least what you know on where the Job Corps Center stands as of today? 
Congressman, we're moving ahead with that, and um, I'm delighted that we have the support from your delegation because I think one of our goals is to try to at least have one Job Corps center in, in every state, and obviously yours uh, was, was very important to us. And we did have some delays, but now we're moving ahead. Right now we are, uh, by the end of the week, I think we're going to take a preliminary step in releasing what we call sources sought notice to gauge what the small business interests are. And that's going to be a very important component so that small businesses can also look at uh, getting involved in this project potentially. So, so based on that, do you feel confident or could you guarantee that the construction of, of this New Hampshire project would be uh, um, focused on New Hampshire businesses only, or do you feel that there is a possibility that outside businesses outside of the state would be part of the construction? Well, we'll find out once we get that information um, as a result of, of uh, what we're going to be posting. Um, my hope is that, yes, all the jobs sure. do stay in the area because that's I, what I, our intent is. Given, um, I think the delegation feels strongly that uh, New Hampshire businesses would certainly qualify. Absolutely. They have done different federal projects in the state in the past. And I would certainly like to see that New Hampshire businesses and New Hampshire jobs for a New Hampshire project are, are paramount as we move forward with the, with the project. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the status of the, um, of the PLA issue or whether there will be a, a PLA? Well, we won't. Uh, we, we are planning on for that to take place. But, you know, once we get all the information and we survey the small businesses and, and potentially their involvement, then we'll, then we'll move forward. I would love, as that process moves forward, to try to uh, keep in communications about the PLA, if a PLA is going to be written, that what the requirements within the PLA are going to be. Um, I, I take the position that I'd like to see a level playing field, and I'd like to see every business, regardless of whether they're union or non-union, have a have a fair opportunity to to work on this project. Um, I understand, and that's why we're doing the Good. survey now. So okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Also, relative to um, the the solicitation phase, are there going to be, or or can you give me an idea on what the green requirements or building requirements would be? I, I can't elaborate on that okay. at this time. But if if there will be green requirements, is that something you can notify the delegation? Absolutely. Uh, okay. And I don't see once we once we identify who the actual contract will go to, um, I'm sure we'll be able to work with you and the delegation because I know they're very interested. Yeah, the reason I ask is, you know, the unemployment rate in New Hampshire within the construction industry is far higher than the actual New Hampshire unemployment rate, which is around five and a half percent, and it's much higher than the the national average uh, of nine point one percent. So, uh, the construction industry is eager to. Uh, to, to work on this job, and I'm eager to see New Hampshire employers and individuals uh, get back to work as quickly as we can. I know that you share in that same vision, so I look forward to working with you on that particular issue. And uh, if there are issues with the PLA, uh, you know, I, I'd like to make sure that uh, we work through those quickly and effectively, and, and try to get this uh, this project underway. And would the gentleman yield? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Department of Labor for sending all members of at least the majority the, uh, the number of training jobs just prior to this that were in their district. Uh, I take note that it was informational and not lobbying. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the committee set about to have this hearing be about proper accounting for job creations and about whether or not we had net job gains or loss and so on, and many people objected to the title. But I just want to close with a, a simple question for Dr. Hall. As I understand it, if I wanted to, I could say that every job fueling a bus, fueling a bus, is a green job because it is a job in mass transit. I could probably say the same thing about every uh, United Airlines pilot, right? Sure. Yeah. The, the logic of the mass transit, of course, is, is that, that every single bus may replace dozens of cars. Okay. So I, I just wanted to understand that for the record, yeah. because an empty bus being driven or an empty train being driven might be inefficient as can be and highly subsidized, but it's a green job. So I look forward to receiving what I would consider to be the undeniable de uh, green jobs. Uh, you've all been very patient. You, uh, you've lived up to our 12 o'clock anticipated deadline. I thank you for Mr. your uh, testimony. With the, uh, just Anita, please. 
just got to get something in the record. I didn't know you were wrapping up. I thought we were. I am wrapping up, but if you have a unanimous consent, I'm yeah, not thank you at this much. time. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted, Mr. Chairman, you just, uh, I, I don't know what you were referring to, but uh, with regard to information. But with, um, Mr. Chairman, I have another document I would like to enter into the record. This is a report I asked my staff to complete for members, all members of our committee. It provides information from the Brookings report and the Departments of Energy and Labor about green initiatives in each of our districts, both Democrats and Republicans. I asked my staff to put together this report so each member could see what programs are going on right now that may contribute to job creation in his or her district, region, metropolitan area. Some of this relates to Recovery Act funding and some of it relates to private funding. Uh, the point is that we need to support this sector because these are the jobs of the future and we have to invest in this future if we want our nation to remain uh, competitive. And I want to also thank, I also want to take the time, uh, I ask this okay. um, I, First of all, I would ask unanimous consent that that inclusion and other extraneous material that members may want to have, they would have five legislative days in, in, in which to place them in the record, no, additional, additional questions, comments uh, for the same period of time. And just one day. last thing, I want to thank the witnesses. I thank you so very, very much. And I really mean that. Because as I listen to all the evidence, I have not heard one scintilla of evidence that shows that your efforts are killing jobs. Now, Dr. Hall, um, I know you are going to come forward with your report. I see you every month, as you well know, in the JEC Joint Economic Committee. So, and I know you at work. And I am looking forward to seeing those numbers, because I agree with the Chairman. I, we want integrity with regard to numbers. We want to know be, that, that these jobs are being produced, because I got people in my, my district. I am telling you, in the area I live in, African American male unemployment is probably 35 to 40 percent. And they are begging for jobs. And so how we define it, I, I, I like to know. But, but I really want to make sure that people get jobs and, and are able to support their family. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I would only ask one closing request. Would all of you be willing to take additional questions from members who had them and couldn't uh, give them today? Then without objection, we will uh, ask that all members will have five days in which to submit their questions and, of course, uh, will hold the record open for your answers. And with that, we stand adjourned.